thanks so much for the organizers. It's, um, it's great to be here. Um, and yeah, so I think I've been invited to offer an evolutionary perspective, sort of evolutionary doom and gloom, perhaps. And uh, uh, so, and it's been, it's been great to learn so much during this meeting. So the title, um, uh, so Philip sort of asked me to talk about antivirulence, so that's in there, one of the levers we can pull but also antibiotics and probiotics that I've heard quite a bit about at this meeting. And so I want to ask how we can use these in a way that balances efficacy uh, with uh, evolutionary risks. Um, so I want to begin with the antibiotic resistance crisis, and what I'm showing here is data from humans. So this emer oops, no, wrong way. emergence and increase in frequency of drug-resistant strains. Now, you know, in a One Health context, this is, of course, also a problem in agriculture, in farming. So we have uh, this shared concern with the uh, increasing failure of our old drugs. Uh, so this is a problem. What truly makes this a crisis, of course, is this emptying of the drug pipeline. So, um, right, so that's the crisis. So what can we do next? Uh, there's lots written about this, lots spoken about this. I think we can boil it down into two easy to say but hard to do solutions. The first one is to simply open the drug pipeline. We can, we can seek out new antibiotics or new antimicrobials, you know, whatever, whatever uh, molecule you like, as long as it kills or cripples bacteria. And if we do this at a rapid enough pace, we can keep up with this evolutionary process. The old drugs fail, but there's always new drugs around the corner. Um, the other generic solution is, of course, to modify the selective pressures on the antibiotics we use, to be smarter about how we use antibiotics. So this, of course, begins with not taking antibiotics if there's a viral in, uh, cause involved, um, but there's more subtle things we can do to, to, cut, to modify the selective pressure on resistance. So one of the things I want to argue today, and you know, generally interest in my lab, is how evolutionary biology and also ecology can contribute to both of these challenges. Um, okay, is this gonna work? So, as an evolutionary biologist, my, my, you know, when I initially became interested in this problem of drug resistance, probably about 10 years ago, you know, I had my evolution hammer, so I thought this is an evolutionary problem, that's all there is. So I thought, okay, all we have to do is figure out how can we maximize the evolutionary robustness, robustness of our interventions, which, we, you know, one metric of this would be the time until failure. The time, for example, the time until 50% of, of the chickens you treat, you have a failure to uh, resolve the infection. Uh, but you know, speaking to clinicians, speaking to farmers, speaking to other researchers with other interests, I realized the problem is a bit more complicated. There are other things we have to worry about. We have to worry about the, the efficacy of the treatment. So if I go inventing some new evolutionary robust therapy, it also has to work. I mean, it's a trivial point, but I think it's, it's often missed in my field at least. So, so we have these two criteria we're interested in, and we can maybe think of other dimensions. It has to be a working treatment, and it has to be a robust treatment. If we have um, sort of a canonical antibiotic-like drug, it could be a bacteriosin, it could be an antimicrobial peptide, it could be a conventional antibiotic. Uh, we can, to begin to address this problem, we built some simple epidemiological models, which I won't go into, but the, the upshot, so Luke McNally was leading the modeling here. The upshot of this work is that we see this uncomfortable trade-off, and it's really quite uh, uh, intuitive. So the more effective your antibiotic, the more we move to the right along this axis, we predict the time until failure of that treatment to get shorter and shorter. So the good news is, you know, with my, my obsession with evolution, was we can devise an evolutionary robust therapeutic. The bad news, it, it, it will necessarily not work very well. So we, you know, so, um, Homeopathic doses of antibiotic will work forever, so there's the good news, right? But if we want things to work, we, need, we face this trade-off. Um, so I'm not going to go in, we have, you know, we're populating this with data, it's not, not quite ready yet, but we're, we're certainly finding support for this constraint. But this, this map also sort of illustrates the challenge we want to address. We want to get up to that question mark up there. The question is, how do we get there? We want treatments that are robust, uh, that work and continue to work into the future. So we know already a little bit about the ingredients we want to bring. So antibiotics remain part of our arsenal. We have these incredibly effective drugs. We have immunity in immunocompetent hosts. This is a very obviously a very powerful mechanism that we want to leverage effectively. 
We have other ingredients that we can bring into bear. So we're very interested in phages, but there are many other sort of novel uh, antimicrobial chemicals that we can bring to bear. And then there's a whole menu of adjuvants that we can bring. So I'm going to talk a little bit about antivirulence drugs. There are anti-resistance compounds. There are transmission blocking compounds and strategies. Diagnostics I'm going to talk about. Vaccines, of course. And then we have to ask, how do we put all these things together? Can we combine, combine compounds? So this is a very popular route. Let's try two antibiotics rather than one. Let's try an antibiotic and an adjuvant. Uh, I also want to talk a little bit more about conditional strategies, strategies that change in response to diagnostic information. I think this is a very powerful solution, actually. OK, so uh, antivirulence drugs first. So antivirulence drugs are uh, drugs that disarm rather than kill bacteria, so that they stop the expression, typically stop the expression or the activity of virulence factors. So virulence factors uh, we can define as non-essential components uh, that predict harm. So these are things such as adhesins, toxins, exoenzymes, immunomodulators, lots of stuff that bacteria do to harm hosts. Um, so, so in a screen for an antivirulence drug, so we have the wild type here, it grows well on a plate and damages the host. This host that looks like it's sleeping is supposed to be sick, okay? Whereas if you knock out a virulence factor or use an antivirulence drug, it grows well in vitro, but the mouse is fine. So that's a sort of a, a classical screen. Um, so this is great for the pipeline. It gives us lots of new molecular targets, so that's certainly exciting. Um, in terms of resistance evolution, at least the initial sort of comments on this, this you know, in the sort of reviews and papers about this, this is going to be great because we're not killing bacteria, there won't be a resistance problem. So in this review, we went through this a little more carefully, and there's actually a lot of reason for concern, but we also mapped out one avenue that we believe is, is going to be more evolutionarily robust. Okay, so there's what we believe is a more evolutionarily robust strategy is to target bacterial virulence factors uh, that, that, uh, are, uh, that are cooperative. Now, this is a strange thing to talk about for microbes. Microbes do a lot of stuff collectively, cooperatively, and so we predict that by targeting bacterial cooperative activities that underpin virulence, um, we can uh, diminish or even reverse selection for resistance. So to give you a sort of a concrete example of what this looks like, I want to talk about siderophores. Here we go. So this is an example of a cooperative virulence trait. So siderophores are uh, molecules that many bacteria produce to scavenge for iron. So the host is an, typically an iron-limited environment. And so they produce these molecules, these siderophore molecules. So an individual cell will produce a molecule that will scoot out into the environment, bind to, a, to, to ferric iron, and then this, uh, this, this siderophore iron complex can be taken up by that cell, but also by other individual cells. So basically, you have an individual cost and a collective benefit from the perspective of the bacteria. So this is an example of microbial cooperation. And so we predict that this will be more robust as a therapeutic target. Because if you have a mutant that pops up, it has a different siderophore, a different way of scavenging iron, it's paying the cost of that innovation, but the benefit will be distributed among other cells. And so selection is, works much less effectively with this, this context. OK, so you knock out siderophores, you suppress virulence. So we use Pseudomonas quite a lot. Uh, this was work in collaboration with Rolf Cummerley's lab, actually. So you can see in black the wild-type survivorship of a, an acute infection in these Galeria wax moths, so it's just an injection. They all die. You knock out, genetically knock out the iron scavenging apparatus, you see an attenuation. Okay, so we use gallium as, a, a, as an antivirulence drug in this context. So gallium is... Uh, is um, a transition metal like iron, it binds with higher affinity to the siderophores. So basically, adding gallium, you titrate out the efficacy of these siderophore molecules. So we see this in the, in the figure to the top left there. So the, the increasing gallium supplementation low doses that are very well tolerated by many hosts. Um, so in the dotted line there, we see if you add gallium to, uh, to bacteria in an iron-rich environment, where the iron acquisition environment uh, mechanism has been disabled, there's very little effect. 
But if you add gallium in an iron limited environment to the wild type, you suppress their ability to grow. So, so it's working in that level. And then in the in vivo uh, experiments, we see something interesting. So actually, in the red, what you see is you see more attenuation than the genetic knockout, which is actually surprising. Normally, the, you know, the, the chemical suppression of a trait doesn't quite recapitulate the genetic knockout. Here we see an excess effect, which is unusual. And the greatest excess was for the intermediate dose. And our handle on this, just a, a sort of a window into the mechanism, is as you increase gallium, you have this behavioral feedback in the organism. The organism responds to the iron limitation by making more siderophore. You see this positive feedback, so you see this increasing slope. But if you had a lot of gallium, the, the negative feedback kicks in and they give up. So what we're seeing here, we think, at this intermediate dosing, is, a, a, is the bug getting caught in this regulatory trap. OK, so this is all very well. We see some effect in vivo. This evolution proof challenge. We then did some experimental evolution. So I always recommend, if you have a new, new therapeutic, do experimental evolution. See how it fails. It's very important to understand how it fails and how you can mitigate that process. But here's a case that did not fail over 12 days. So 12 days is not very long. So what we have here is the, in black, is the control treatment. So this is just the integral of daily growth. It's a measure of how well Pseudomonas is growing in this environment. And then we have the level of growth for intermediate and higher doses of gallium. So we were suppressing Pseudomonas, and over 12 days of serial passage, Pseudomonas could not solve this problem. So it's robust over 12 days, not very long. But we can benchmark this against equivalent control by our existing antibiotics. And so I think this is the fun part of this result. So you can, let, you can introduce, you can, we controlled with gentamicin, panel B. In about six days, Pseudomonas had solved the problem of gentamicin. Easy, no problem, at, at intermediate and higher doses. Ciprofloxacin similarly converges to the control in about six days. No problem. Then we gave Pseudomonas a hard challenge. We gave it two drugs. So we gave intermediate and high doses of the combination. And again, you see this rapid evolutionary solution, whereas the gallium was able to maintain uh, suppression. So I think this is an interesting result. Um, that, it, that sort of supports this claim that targeting collective behaviors or cooperative behaviors is more evolutionarily robust. The problem as I see it though is back to this, this, this efficacy challenge. So we have these two axes, so we can beat the constraint, we can get into the white space, but frankly, if I was really sick or my kids were sick, I don't want to give them gallium, I want an antibiotic. I want a bactericidal antibiotic to take out the bacteria. I want something effective. So we're still left with this challenge of, of, of improving efficacy. So I think one uh, key move here is the, um, the use of conditional strategies. So this is David McAdams. He's an economist at Duke uh, in the US. And we've been chatting for a while now about the use of conditional strategies to address the antibiotic resistance challenge. And so what got us thinking is the use of point of care resistance diagnoses, which is, of course, well, certainly in, in biomedicine, uh, is, is gaining a lot of attention and traction as, as a sort of a, uh, 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 for, 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 for the appropriate treatment of patients in a, in a healthcare setting. So this is great news for treatments. If you have a rapid diagnostic, if, of course, if you're resistant to drug one, you get antibiotic two. If you're not resistant, you get antibiotic one. This sounds like a great idea for patient care. The challenge we wanted to address is what does this mean for public health? Can we use, how effective is this kind of intervention going to be to improve public health and broadly the resistance crisis? And so we can ask this in a One Health context. Will rapid diagnostics help to manage infections in a farm setting, in a One Health setting? I think the logic uh, carries over, but bear with me as I talk about humans <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and actually respiratory infections, just to really go off piste for this meeting. Okay, so let's think about the sort of um, the, the status quo. So what we have here is a, a, a schematic of a population of hosts, okay? This is a schematic of an epidemiological model. So these boxes represent different classes of people or, or chickens. So the black, the black S box are the individuals that are not infected. They're susceptible to infection, but they're not infected. And then the brown boxes represent individuals that are infected, okay, and that are going to undergo treatment with an antibiotic. The different subs, so they're all infected, 
they all present with the same phenotype, this brown, sick phenotype, sort of demanding attention. But the numbers, the subscripts, refer to their resistances. So I0 is the pan-susceptible genotype. I2 is resistant to drug 2, I1 to drug 1. I1-2 is pan-resistant. That's obviously problematic. So under the current sort of status quo, you're sick, you get the frontline drug, which is drug 1. Okay, this will shorten the infection of drug 1 susceptible strains and will reward the drug resistant strains. This is what we know. This is just selection for resistance. But now if we have uh, this, this magic box in the pharma in the clinic where we can rapidly diagnose individuals, so now the veterinarian or the clinician has these x-ray goggles can, to discriminate these different genotypes and, and, and give appropriate antibiotics to, uh, to the genotype. So obviously, I0 will get drug 1, I2 will get drug 1, I1 will get drug 2, et cetera. That's all straightforward. What we're suggesting in top, though, is we can make additional behavioral uh, interventions to put the thumb on the scale to differentially penalize resistant strains. So if you carry a resistance, if you're I2 or I1, yes, you'll get an appropriate drug, but we could also administer some transmission control measure. If you're a kid, maybe you're going to stay home from school. Uh, if you're a chicken, then I'm sure there's other things you can do uh, to limit transmission. Uh, I1-2, this is the pan-resistant case. So for humans, this is where we can do heavier measures of discovery and contact tracing, isolation. I think in a farm context, this is pub, uh, culling, I imagine, might be more of a, an option. Um, okay, so we can, so we, again, we built these epidemiological models and we can play with the parameters. So for a generic acute infection, the parameter space, uh, the behavior of the model looks something like this. We've got diagnostic delay in days and we've got cost of resistance on the y-axis. The blue space is the magic parameter space where we can select against resistance. So this resistance crisis is going into reverse. So at the top there, you see this no resistance diagnostics. To get into that space without any resistance diagnostics, we have to assume that resistance is super costly. That's a 50% cost, right? So that's really impossible. That's not, that's not not plausible. But what we find is with resistance diagnostics, even cost-free resistance can be selected against if we, if we have a sufficiently rapid diagnostic. And you notice the time scale is not, is not you know, in the cl clinic, we're talking about one-hour diagnostic results. For this public health concern, we, we can be a little slower and it can still work. So that was the most optimistic part of my talk. Now I sort of add complexities and challenges, and one of the major challenges, which I, I believe is, is common to animal, uh, to, 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 to various hosts, is the problem of carriage states. Most of the pathogens we worry about spend a lot of time in, in, in humans and other animals in, a, in an asymptomatic carriage state. So this really complexifies the model, makes it more interesting. So now we have these two genotypes. They spend a lot of time under the radar in carriage. So, um, you're not, so you, have a, you have a potential pathogen, you're not actually infected, you're not expressing the symptoms. And this introduces this problem of bystander selection. So while you know, I'm walking around carrying a bunch of uh, uh, potential or opportunistic pathogens in my gut and my nasopharynx and wherever, if I take an antibiotic, I'm going to penalize susceptible strains uh, without recognizing uh, that effect necessarily. Okay, so this problem of bystander selection was recently flagged by uh, Christine Tedejanto and Mark Lipsitch, we've been working with in Harvard. And so this is just a, uh, uh, some of their data, actually. So what we're, what we're looking at is the rate of bystander exposure. So this is the, the rate at which you're, a, you're, a, you're a, a potential pathogen, the rate at which you're exposed to antibiotics due to some other cause. And then this is the rate at which you are the focal pathogen and you, you therefore face antibiotics because of your dastardly deeds in a host. And, you, and the general result is these organisms, for humans at least, are seeing a lot more antibiotic as bystanders as, than they are as the focal pathogen. Now, I have no idea how the parameters stack up in an animal context, but I'd be very interested to know. Um, okay, so, so let's look at strep pneumo, so this respiratory bug. Um, which has a uh, you know, very significant human pathogen, and so we have carriage in the nasopharynx. So playing with the model, what we see is, as we extend the duration of carriage, this sort of blue space that is this, the, you know, the, the, the wonderful problem-solved space disappears, 
and we move into sort of normal service of using antibiotics we select for resistance because of this uh, increasing dominance of bystander selection. They're seeing most of their antibiotics when they're in carriage. Okay. So there is, you know, we, we, we do have a, actually a solution. The logical response to this is simple. The implementation is more difficult. We need carriage diagnostics. We need to be able to differentiate these genotypes, these C0 and C1 genotypes. The, 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 that's the, the resistant and susceptible genotypes in carriage. We need to be able to see and act differentially on that carriage information. So if we're able to do that, again, this is logically straightforward, but hard to do, if we're able to do that, then we can solve this problem. So actually, there have been experiments or sort of clinical trials in Sweden that have done effectively, essentially what we're proposing. So this was uh, actually some time ago in Sweden where they went into, into nurseries, they swabbed kids, uh, uh, and they would uh, impose heightened transmission control if they found a kid with a resistant genotype of strep pneumo in their nasopharynx. What they did was the kid would just was sent home for the rest of the week. So basically they were removed from the population and this penalized the resistant strain. So we can take some of this data and sort of scale it up and what we find is this now, if we have, so this is the rate of carriage diagnostics uh, on the x-axis, and this is ha the extent to which we can penalize the transmission of the resistance strain during carriage on the y-axis. So if we have no carriage diagnostics, we're stuck in this white space, resistance is going up year after year, but it only takes a little bit of carriage diagnostics to get into this blue space. So for, for the parameters for, you know, our estimates of the parameters for strep pneumo, it will take annual surveillance and with only a 20% reduction in, in the, the relative transmission of the resistance strain in carriage to deal with this issue. Okay, um, there we go. So I wanna talk about another sort of, so this is conditional on the resistance genotype, that's one kind of conditionality. So I'm gonna to begin to talk about some other conditionalities. Another, so this is uh, uh, Christopher wallin waldertoft in my lab, an MD actually in my lab, and so, We've been talking more and more about conditioning treatments on the severity of symptoms, which is a very simple idea. And the sort of impetus for this was a, a review in the Lancet Infectious Diseases, which was damning about all of the, you know, the menu of novel therapeutics. It basically said, I think this was the title, right? Novel therapeutics are inadequate for serious infections. So basically, what they, they went through, phage therapy, antivirulence drugs, a whole host of, you know, you know, your, you know, your favorite new trick doesn't work. And the benchmark they set was, was, in my view, very high, and, and for a reason. They set the bench as sepsis. So this is, you know, the case of invasive, you know, bacteremia with all the inflammatory sig sig signals that you're about to die, okay? And this is the context where you have, you know, up to 50% chance of mortality, antibiotics are central effect, you know, and, 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 and effective if you get them soon enough. So that was the benchmark. And they were saying that none of the other therapies are anywhere close to this. So our sort of, really a bit of a thought experiment was to just, okay, well, let's think about how we actually use antibiotics. Yes, they're absolutely essential in this, you know, last line hospital context, but that's a sliver of our use. That's hospital use in its entirety is that sliver. Sepsis or, you know, Life-threatening infections is a sliver of that sliver. Of course, we use most of our antibiotics in the community, and what I'm not showing here is the other half of the pie of antibiotic use in agriculture. So we use it mostly for mild self-resolving conditions, really getting people back to work a couple days earlier. And so the kind of presentations, this was a, a sort of a global survey, it's UTIs, pharyngitis, otitis, things that if you're healthy, you will resolve in a week or so. And so, the, the sort of implication from this thought experiment is, is that we should use lower efficacy drugs for mild infections if you're immunocompetent and, we, in, and the, the other various risks are addressed in, to, in order to preserve these amazing antibiotics that we still have for life-threatening cases. So we can go back to the map of these two desirable quantities and this helps a lot. The assumption in this figure is that we use all of these different drugs with equal intensity. The picture will change if we taper off our use and the most effective drugs we use very rarely. 
that will extend their lifespan, that will push that contour backwards. But it means we're going to be pummeling this sort of medium efficacy window. And this is where I think these antivirulence drugs, which I sort of went off for a bit because they're not very effective, this is where I think they may play a role. Okay, so I want to sort of switch to one of the uh, empirical context that I'm, you know, my lab is most interested in, but I think there's a strong, well, I hope there's a parallel to microbiome research generally. So we're interested in chronic infections for a bunch of reasons. So chronic infections are just complicated, intractable in many cases, that's why we, they're chronic infections, because medics can't, can't treat them, they can't effectively clear the infection. These are infections that just do not resolve. They're, they're complex in multiple ways, they're spatially structured. They're multi-species, they're polymicrobial, and we have this problem of poor antibiotic efficacy. So I'm flagging here, this, these are issues for microbiomes generally. So these are the kind of themes that my lab are particularly interested in, sort of by the behavioral dynamics of bugs in these complex situations, the evolutionary dynamics, the spatial patterning. What I want to focus on for the remainder of my talks is this issue of community dynamics. Okay, so we have multi-species. The empirical context that we work with is um, we have some great colleagues in the uh, Emory um, Atlanta Cystic Fibrosis Clinic. And so people with cystic fibrosis, this genetic condition, end up with lifetime lung infections. And um, typically the, the leading cause of death is, pseudomonas, uh, is attributed to Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Okay, and other pathogens too play key roles. So, so one of the sort of really, you know, sort of eye-opening results in this context is that doctors are truly flying blind. So what we're looking at here is the absolute uh, futility of resistance diagnostics. So I began my talk saying, what we need is great diagnostics. Well, it depends on the context. If you're one of these chronic infection contexts or a microbiome context in, a, in essence, then resistance diagnostics are pretty much useless. What we're seeing here is uh, the treatment of individuals that tested positive for Pseudomonas aeruginosa the, um, the y-axis is a measure of the health outcome. It's a measure of lung function, but it's, you know, generalize this as a measure of the health outcome of the treatment. Sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down. The unit of analysis is the patient, or the unit of analysis is the exacerbation. But what you can see is whether it goes up or goes down has nothing to do with whether the pseudomonas you pulled out of that patient was resistant or susceptible to the drug you treated them with. So to me, this is really striking. There's lots of hypotheses we could explore here. What we're really pursuing is the, is the, is the, is the role of polymicrobial interactions. There's more than one pathogen in that in, in a host, and there's a whole bunch of other microbes too. So we work with um, uh, the CF clinic led by uh, Arlene St Stasenko. We work closely with Joanna Goldberg, also at Emory. And so we've been gathering cystic fibrosis sputum samples and various health metrics to sort of map out this project. First of all, we're interested in the association between the state of this, the microbiome and the health of the patient. So we can do the kind of sort of association studies. So here we're just coloring patients uh, and their microbiomes um, by the severity of their symptoms. So in red, very low lung function. So on the cusp of a lung transplant, in green, these are, have pretty normal lung function actually. We also have an experimental way to probe the system here, so I'll talk more about this. We have experimental model communities that we can perturb with antibiotics and probiotics and, and any therapy we want. Our goal, one of our goals, is to build a mathematical model of the community to ask how these species interact with each other. So then we have a map of health, you know, what's a healthy state, what's a disease state. We have a mechanistic model of how the community functions. And then putting this together, this in, th in principle will lead us towards uh, optimized or at least informed interventions. Uh, and so the, the, this is sort of a map of the project. It's really early days, uh, but I just thought I'd share this with you. Um, so on this sort of health mapping issue, one of the tools we use is machine learning. This is Conan, who's been leading the machine learning. So we're trying to predict lung function, you know, predict a health outcome from the, micro the microbiome content. And so you, know, you do this kind of analysis, you end up with a bunch of um, sort of weightings or, or, or scores for the different microbes. And so first of all, we have this sanity check that Pseudomonas, this notorious number one pathogen, is a negative predictor of health. So we, we've passed the sanity check, so pathogens are bad. 
That's, uh, that's comforting, right? Uh, but we see a bunch of bugs that are predictive of uh, uh, improved outcomes or improved health. So, but of course, what we don't have here is causality. They could be biomarkers, and that's very important, right? So it could be, these could be biomarkers of health, although you can just get someone to breathe into a pipe and you figure out how well their lung's doing. Um, but we have this sort of, you know, the possibility that they may be probiotics, they may be acting in a way that is, is, is resisting colonization by these more severe pathogens. And so Veonella is one of the ones that I want to keep your eye on. So to address this problem of causality, we build an experimental model, which uh, I think is um, actually important for this kind of work. So what we have here is there's some advantages uh, granted for the, the CF microbiome. It's relatively species poor. So about 12 species account for about 90% of the reads we find in, in, in a CF uh, sputum sample. We can recapitulate much of the physiology in vitro. So we use a synthetic sputum, which has been extensively benchmarked by my colleague Marvin Whiteley. Basically, it's slime. It's got, it's got the nutritional composition of sputum. We add mucins. We add DNA. So it also has the viscosity. And bugs grow as these little sort of characteristic aggregates. So they're not sitting on the side. They're not, not making conventional biofilms, but they are spatially structured. OK. And so we take two broad strategies. One's a top-down strategy. We'll take sputum. So this is microbiome, this complex community from a patient. We'll culture it into this synthetic sputum. And we can trial new interventions. We can trial antibiotics, probiotics. And we can see how the community responds to these perturbations. But we can also take a bottom-up approach where we, we use defined communities. So again, so these are our players. These are the actual bugs we use. So in red are the pathogens that clinical microbiology uh, cares about in the context of cystic fibrosis. So Pseudomonas, Haemophilus, Staph, Acromobacter, Burkholderia. These are all you know, on the watch list. But then we have a bunch of other bugs that are largely orally derived that we find in some abundance in, in the lung of these people. So we can play with these in different ways, these communities. Oh, and we're also developing a phage fire. We're interested in phages. So we have a library of phages interacting with Pseudomonas, and I'm happy to chat about that later. So some of the things we can do with this kind of a system, we can do pairwise experiments. We can ask how one individual affects another. So we do this in different ways. And this will give us a network of interactions. So here we have, we see some facilitation going on, but we see mostly competition. And so Veonella over there is actually inhibiting Pseudomonas. So you know, back to this, yes, it's a marker of health, but there may be some functional interaction going on there. We can then do experiments where we put you know, sort of multi-way experiments. We, put, we, we assemble communities with multiple species. So in this case, so on the left here, we're seeing a diverse community at time zero. So these different panels are different replicates. We had multiple replicates, just showing you three replicates here. And we passage, we do subculture in this sputum medium. So every two days, they got subcultured. And what we're seeing, we're losing a lot of the pathogens, and we're seeing dominance by a lot of these oral bugs, these oral anaerobes in particular. So we're dominating by Veonella, Prevotella, and some Haemophilus in the absence of any perturbation. But now we kick the system with antibiotics, and you see some unfortunate outcomes. So tobramycin, not a lot happens, but meropenem, and then some of the combinations, you see dominance by pathogens, and you see an interesting alternate state. So if, sorry, if you go back to the control, what's, what's to, very pleasing to my eye, at least, is these replicates are really on a tram line. There's a very repeatable dynamic to this system. Once you start throwing antibiotics, you see these alternate states popping up. So meropenem, we're seeing, we're seeing uh, 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 dominance by staph. Tobramycin and meropenem, we go towards Acromobacter or Burkholderia. Both pretty terrible, actually, for, in a patient context. OK, so, um, so the, you know, the, the summary here is you hit this community with antibiotics, and you're rewarded with more pathogens and more drug-resistant pathogens. OK. So you know, I said at the beginning of this section, we're interested in building mathematical models of these communities. So we use, a, actually, a sort of baseline model is a, sort of a generic community ecological model, so a generalized Lockerfeld terror model. We can take the data I just showed you in the previous slide, use that data, it's a very rich data set, lots of information in the time series of that data to infer species-species interactions. So this is showing the model inference. 
And so we have the effect of the actor on a recipient. The diagonal is your, the effect on yourself. So red is a negative effect. So everybody in, inhibits their own growth. Um, Veonella is this sort of universal inhibitor. That's the inference from the data. Pseudomonas is actually facilitating some others again. Um, but we, we have more, more work to do to validate these interactions, and so that's ongoing. Okay, and when we validate this model, so this is, this is really a holding, a holding place, you know, the goal is to understand the trajectories through this, this complex space. What are the community assembly rules? How do you get from a healthy state to a, to a dysbiotic state? And, and can we use probiotics and antibiotics and other interventions as levers to shape transitions from one state to an alternate state? So these are the sort of challenges that we're interested in. Um, and, and again, I you know, stress that, the, that this lung microbiome, this infection microbiome is relatively species poor. This is, this is certainly more difficult in more complex gut contexts. I, I, I don't want to shy away from that. Okay, so I think I'm about to wrap up. So, what I've talked about a lot today are conditional interventions. Well, the first thing I talked about was that antibiotic efficacy is desirable, or treatment efficacy. It doesn't have to be a conventional antibiotic. You know, I tend not to believe in this time it's different. If you're killing pathogens, there will be an evolutionary response. There will be an ecological and evolutionary response. And we see this trade-off between efficacy and the other desirable quantity of something continuing to work, evolutionary robustness. Um, so I talked about antivirulence drugs, you know, chasing after cooperative behaviors. They can be disproportionately robust. We can do better than the equivalent control by an antibiotic, but there is a question over their efficacy. And then I talked about conditional strategies tied onto point-of-care resistance diagnostics. And then in this simple model, where as soon as you acquire a pathogen, it immediately causes symptoms, and then you can treat it, then you can get both. You can get efficacy and evolutionary robustness. And actually, antibiotics become a kind of a form of renewable resources. You use, you use antibiotic tr two to drive susceptibility to antibiotic one. But you know, back in the real world, we have a whole sort of litany of complications. We have carriage. This is opportunistic pathogens going under the radar, not causing symptoms for a period of time, but still undergoing selection by antibiotics. We have chronic infections. We have serious life-threatening infections. They all require broader diagnostic inputs and a menu of levers, including probiotics, antibiotics, and novel therapeutics, whatever they are. Um, certainly, the logic still holds, but there are technical and strategic challenges as we move into these more complex uh, arenas. Okay, so I'm about to just thank the lab. So thank everyone in the lab who's done uh, the work I presented and some key collaborators. So Luke in Edinburgh and Rolf, particularly in Zurich, for the, for the gallium stuff. So that the gallium experiments were all done in Rolf's lab. And then folks with their diagnostics uh, and, and the Emory folks for the, um, uh, the CF stuff. And I'll be happy to take any questions. <laughs>